started begin my EP training inspired by Dr. Ullas sir. And uh, now uh, he has given, interested me with the work of inspiring you with ECG reading uh, immediately after this post lunch. Okay, so I'll try my best. Uh, so we'll go ahead with this, uh, my topic with in this following order. It's like, we'll just revise normal conduction the properties of the specialized conduction tissues, the mechanism of this nodal conduction blocks, and what are the clinical presentations, causes, and to recognize, how can, how can you recognize this? And uh, uh, we will not conclude, we'll conclude with few examples so that we'll again revise whatever we have learned in this presentation. Uh, normal conduction system as such, you know, heart's uh, important function is to pump, uh, pump blood from it into different organs. So it needs to have an electrical impulse, which starts from the sinus node and goes through specialized internodal tracts or specialized atrial tissues into the AV node and then bifurcates into right bundle and left bundle and depolarizes and ventricle contracts. This is a, uh, uh, this AV node, okay, this AC node is something like a pulse generator, it's generating the pulse. So if it fails, there will be some subsidiary pacemakers like junction or ventricle rhythm, it will take, take part in uh, generating a rhythm, okay. So if AV node, uh, the part of, the property of AV node is like a relay center, something like your check post, which st stops the impulse, waits for some time, this waiting is imperative that uh, the AV node, uh, the atrium has to contract and the ventricle has to fill. So it is like you are, uh, this is a physiological imperative mechanism for atrium to contract and ventricle to fill and then uh, ventricle, blood is pumped out of the ventricle. So what are the functions of this AV node? Okay, the functions are it has to generate the impulse. So automaticity is the important function of the AV node and it has to transmit the impulse from AV node into the atrial tissues so that it goes back, goes to the uh, uh, AV node and conducts down. And uh, it is under immense control of autonomic neural tissues. So the autonomic control is imperative, is very much important in the sinus node functions. When, when it comes to AV node, okay, AV node is something, as I said, it's like a check post. So AV node conduction is almost uh, represented by the PR interval in your surface ECG. Even though AV node conduction, PR interval also represents a part of atrial depolarization and also some part of infra is conduction also. It, for practical purposes, AV node conduction is equal to PR interval. So this is an important factor to always analyze. So a nodal conduction delay will always be reflected with increase in PR interval. So. And other part which you need to remember is the AV node conduction is accommodative. What I mean by accommodative is uh, A to V conduction will always be one to one. Okay, so if you are pacing in a ventricle atrium at 100 beats per minute and ventricle is getting contracted under beats per minute. So if you are increasing the pacing rate, so atrium is getting paced at 120, 130, it will slowly 140, okay, it starts to winky back. That is the PR interval prolongs and then goes into two is to one block and blocks. So this is a property of the AV node. So uh, uh, this is uh, from our MBBS time, it has been told that AV node behaves like a elastic, okay? And below AV node, it be like, behaves like a plastic. So elastic is something like it stretches and drops, okay, and breaks. So plastic is something like it immediately breaks. So if it is an infranodal conduction, either it conducts one is to one, or it doesn't conduct. But if it's an AV node, it conducts, it accommodates, it keeps on increasing its PR interval, winky backs, and then drops. So this analogy should be kept in mind. And this differentiation is also very important when we analyze the ECGs at a later point of time. So if it is a nodal block, okay, what you're going to get would be, that is, at the AV node, you're going to get a stable junctional rhythm. That is a rhythm which is narrow, which could be stable. On the other hand, if it is a uh, infranodal block, okay, it is going to be a wide QRS rhythm and it may not be stable. So if you see these kind of patients, if it is an infranodal block, you treat the patient and then evaluate the etiology. If it is a nodal block, you 
uh, evaluate the etiology, you need not hurriedly go and treat the patient. So the symptoms are, okay, most of these patients, if these patients have a good escape rate and maintain a good cardiac output, most of them are asymptomatic. But some patients, if the uh, cardiac output is decreased because of bradycardia and all those things, so they can present with syncope, pre-syncope, dizziness, mental confusion, or palpitation, shortness of breath, or exercise intolerance. So there are varied uh, causes of uh, involvement of these nodes, eh? both the sinus node and the AV node. But broadly it can be classified as, it could be degenerative involvement of the nodal tissues, or it can be ischemia or infiltration or infection, or it can be drugs or electrolytes which might cause impairment of this nodal conduction, or in some places it might be a vagal involvement which could cause delay in the conduction in these nodal tissues. So coming back to the sinus node disease as such, so sinus node can be diseased either by uh, is, if there is a failure of to generate the impulse, okay, or it could be a failure of impulse transmission. So if it's a failure of impulse generation, okay, the sinus beat, sinus node is firing at less than 60 beats per minute, you call that a sinus bradycardia. So if the sinus impulse is not getting out of uh, the sinus node, you call that a sinus pause or sinus, you call that a sinus exit block. But if the sinus node is not totally firing at all, okay, there is no impulse generation of the sinus node at all, you call this sinus pause or arrest. And uh, if there is involvement of both, the, both these mechanisms, you generally call that a sinus node dysfunction or a sick sinus syndrome. So basic definition is, if it's a sinus pause or an arrest, it's a disorder of this automaticity in which no impulse are generated within the sinus node. So it is a generator failure. So if it comes to sinoatrial block, it, the impulses are getting generated in the sinus node, but it is not getting transmitted into the atrium. So it is a transmission failure. So this is an uh, uh, example of sinus pause or arrest, okay. So uh, pa the, you could see that first two beats are going at, a 60 be at around 60 beats per minute and there is a immediate cessation, electrical cessation of any activity and there is no P wave at all. So this is called a sinus pause. And uh, the difference between a sinus pause and sinus arrest is almost like arbitrary. We keep, if it is more than three seconds or prolonged sinus pause, you called it as sinus arrest. So that, that value is almost arbitrary. So this can happen even in normal individuals, okay? This can happen even while you're sleeping or uh, during your uh, REM sleep, okay? So if the sinus pause is happening at daytime and you call that a significant if it is at least more than 2.5 seconds or three seconds, only then it can cause some kind of giddiness or syncope in these kind of patients. Coming to sinoatrial exit block, as the name suggests, the is a, it's a transmission failure. It is almost classified as, just like your uh, AV nodal conduction disease, it's classified as three types. It's a first degree AV block or a second degree AV block or a third degree, okay? If it's a first degree AV block, the sinus node impulses which are formed, okay, are getting deliredly conducted into the atrium, okay? But if it is a second degree AV block, there is intermittent conduction. You, it is further divided into type 1 and type 2 depending on whether uh, type 1 is when there is progressive delay and there is a, a drop in the beat. And if it is a uh, sudden drop in the beat without any progressive delay from sinoatrial tissue conduction, it is a type 2 block. So, and there is no conduction at all, okay, it requires like electrically silent, okay, and it, the lower pacemakers take, take over the action, it is a third degree SA block. We'll go into the examples of each and one. This is a line diagram which you could see. The first one is a normal uh, uh, sinus, uh, it's a sinus rhythm, where you could see that this stroke are the sinus depolarization, okay? So this is a normal beat which is going around 70 beats per minute. What happens in prime, uh, first degree AV block, the sinus depolarization which is happening in the sinus node is not getting reflected in your surface ECG, okay? So sinus depolarization, since it is not getting reflected, you will not be able to find that in the surface ECG. So you will just find that the P waves are going normally. So it cannot be assessed in a surface ECG. But when it comes to second degree 
a save log. If in, in case of this, uh, if you can see here, there is almost shortening of the PP interval and then there is a drop. And here you could see there is sudden drop. There is one P wave and sudden drop, sudden pause, and then again it goes like this. So this is type two, second degree SA block. This is type one progressive delay and then drop. So again, if it is a PP is progressively shortening until one P is getting missed, it is a Mobitz type one SA block. Okay, and if, uh, if it is suddenly dropping without any progressive delay, without PP not getting shortened, it is second degree, uh, it is second degree Mobitz type two block. So you could see here, okay, again it's a type one example where your PP interval at start, okay, is 0.80 seconds, okay. The next PP interval comes at 0.72 seconds and then there is a missing P wave, okay. So almost like there is four P waves to three which is getting conducted and there is no P wave here, okay. So it is a Mobitz type one second degree SSA block, okay. So this can be easily identified if there is a group beating and you find a fixed PR interval and in the, in the pause which you find there is no P waves at all. So it means the sinus node is not functioning well. So it is a Mobitz type one SSA block. In case of Type 2 SA exit block, you could see the PP interval, okay, here, it's almost constant, okay. PP interval is constant, but there is sudden missing of the P wave. So this PP interval is getting shortened in Mobitz type, two, type 1 because of increment, uh, the decrement conduction, uh, increment and the decrement is decreased, is almost nil, okay. So here it is like, one P wave is abruptly dropped out and this PP interval, okay, will be the multiple of the basic PP interval. So, if you encounter someone with a pause with no P waves, there are only two broad possibilities, okay. It can either be a sinus pause or a sinus exit block, okay. So, if it is a multiple of PP interval, it is an exit block and if it is not a multiple of PP interval, it is a sinus pause. It's like, if, uh, if you look at this, wall clock, if you're taking the battery out of this wall clock, okay, and you're again inserting the battery in immediately inside, it is going to just tick on one tick only when you insert the battery inside, okay. So in case of exit block, it is like you, you're not watching the wall clock, okay, and suddenly you are, after three seconds or four seconds, you're watching the wall clock, it's going to be the multiples of seconds. So uh, this exit block, will always be the multiple of PP interval and if it's a sinus pause or arrest, it will not be a multiple of PP interval. And coming on to sinus node dysfunction, the definition is as such the heart rates are inappropriate for the physiological demands and will result in symptoms or arrhythmia. This is some, a broad spectrum. It can be a sinus bradycardia, exit block or a sinus pause or an arrest or it can just be a bradycardia, tachycardia syndrome, or it might be a chronotropic inf incompetence. So uh, this is an example of tachy tachybrady syndrome where you can see the upper uh, trace which is showing that there is an atrial flutter with variable conduction. And again, there is a sinus arrest, okay, and then it starts with the junctional escape. So this is a classical tachybrady syndrome which happens in sinus node dysfunction. Coming, going back to uh, AV nodal conduction disease as such, okay, it is again classified like your sino, sinoatrial uh, conduction diseases, where, but the extra category here is a 2 is to 1 AV block, okay. So, if it's a first degree AV block, it's similar to your sinus node, okay, the a conduction from the atrium is not going, is getting delayed and going into the ventricles. But all the P waves are getting conducted into the ventricles. So, it will be just manifested as increase in PR interval. Okay, on the other hand, in Mobitz type 1 second degree AV block, there is progressive PR prolongation and then there will be a block in the P wave, uh, block in the P, uh, conduction. If it's Mobitz 2, there will be sudden drop and sudden conduction failure, there won't be any progressive increase in the PR interval. And if it's a third degree AV block, okay, there won't be, there will be total AV dissociation. Atrium will be beating on its own, okay, and ventricle will be beating on its own. And the atrial rate will be definitely uh, uh, faster than the ventricle rate. So here, there is an extra category here which says that that's two is to one AV block. Here, if it's two is to one AV block, the every other P wave is getting dropped. If every other P wave is getting dropped, 
you are not you will not be able to compare whether the pr interval is getting prolonged okay in the previous beat or not so this kind of two is to a navy block can either belong to mobits type 1 or mobits type 2 okay so why is it important to differentiate these okay mobits type 1 and type 2 is uh, basically if it's mobits type 1 okay it means the level of block is usually at the nodal level and the escape is stable okay you need not immediately intervene if it's a mobits type 2 if the escape is infranodal okay it is not stable and you need to intervene immediately so this is a flow chart just to easily find out what kind of block it is so just look at the pr interval if it's a constant length okay yes if it is a constant length and you get a dropped qrs okay then it belongs to uh, there are no dropped qrs then every beat is getting conducted with a prolonged pr interval so it's a first degree av block but if the pr interval is constant but there is still there is a blocked qrs okay the, there is definitely a pause after a p wave so it means it is a second degree type 2 av block but on the other hand okay if pr interval is not constant okay and uh, it means it can belong to third degree or second degree type 1 block but in third degree there will be a complete av dissociation that is not all qrs complexes will be f preceded by a p wave but in case of second degree type 1 block, all Q can QRS complexes will be preceded by a P wave. So this is an easy flow chart to remember. Okay, so this is again uh, uh, representative that each PR interval is constant and there are no dropped QRS. It means it belongs to the first degree AB block. It, this is an example of Mobitz type 1 where I uh, already mentioned it's like the level of block at the nodal level and it may not require immediate attention unless there are symptoms and it can be even physiological in some young athletes who has increased vagal tone and a typical Wenke back will is usually is when the PR is progressively increasing till the Q dropped QRS and the RR is continuously is shortening uh, before the dropped QRS and the PR after the block is uh, PR after the block is the shortest and it is definitely shorter than the uh, PR before the block. So this is a typical Winky back phenomenon. So if it is a type 2 Mobitz block, second degree, it means the anatomical level of block is below the node. Okay, And uh, you need to look at QRS interval for assessing whether there is bundle branch block associated with it or a myocardial disease. And this is definitely not physiological. It can never be physiological because all Mobitz type 2 could will always be pathological. And it might require immediate attention in case of in, in patients in some patients with pacing. So if it's a third degree AV block, we discourage our residents in saying a complete a complete heart block in these scenarios because some patients really get threatened by the word of complete heart block. So we always in, in front of patients, we always use it's a third degree AV block. So in third degree AV block, the atrium and the ventricles are dissociated. Okay, so there is a regular PP interval, regular RR interval, but the atrial rate is faster than the ventricle rate. So in this in this third degree AV block, the complexes can either be uh, narrow, okay, the escape complexes can either be narrow or wide. If it's an escape complex is narrow, it is a stable rhythm, okay, it's coming from somewhere junction. And if it's wide, it is from an unstable rhythm, okay. Uh, in case of congenital third degree AV block, it will usually be a stable escape rhythm that is a narrow QRS complex. So here, again, you can go through this thing, okay. So whether the PR interval is constant or not, okay. You could see here, the PR interval is varying. So if the PR interval is varying, just see whether every QRS is preceded by a P wave, if there is AV dissociation is present or not. So it means that PR interval is not constant and there is AV dissociation present. So this is a third degree AV block. So this, will, this slide will summarize how to exactly localize where the block is. So if it is, if for simplicity, I've just divided into nodal and infranodal. Okay, so if it is a nodal block, you are expecting a rhythm which is immediately coming from the junction, so it's going to be narrow. If it's an infranodal, it's going to be broad. Okay, and even case of two is to an AV block or any other uh, blocks, just look at what is the conducted PR interval. Okay, PR interval represents 
conduction through the AV node into the ventricle. So if PR interval is getting conducted, it's, pro it's conducted with a prolonged PR, it means that there is a nodal involvement. If the conducted PR is normal, okay, it means it can be an infranodal involvement. Okay, and the atropine and exercise are going to increase the AV nodal, nodal conduction by sympathetic activity. So, uh, so it will improve a conduction in the nodal tissue, okay, so the block will improve, but on the other hand, if inf infranodal it will worsen, okay, and carotid massage will worsen the block in uh, nodal, nodal uh, blocks and it will uh, improve the conduction in the infranodal. So, whenever there is a group beating, okay, so think about Venki backing, okay. If there is a group beating, okay, there is Venki backing which is present and look whether the Venki backing, okay, when the pass is with the P wave or uh, without a P wave. If it is without a P wave, it means the sinus node is a dysfunction, okay. If it is uh, without a P wave, it means sinus node is a dysfunction. If it is with the P wave, it means that uh, AV node is a dysfunction. So, Symptoms will dictate treatment in a sinus node disease, okay. So, even if the rate is lower, okay, sinus node is a stable rhythm, okay. So, symptoms will dictate the treatment there. But in case of AV node, it is both the symptoms and what escape you have, whether it is a narrow or a broad QRS escape, will dictate the symptoms in them, okay. And the other important thing, whenever in case of an emergency in an ER, okay, if it is a infranodal block, we treat the patient and then evaluate. If it is supra, if it is a nodal block, you can wait. Okay, you can evaluate and then treat the patient. And always, if there is a bradycardia in a patient and if it's an infranodal, you are going to give atropine. You are going to worsen the conduction there, and the block is going to increase. That is, your two is to one block is going to become a three is to one or four is to one block, and it might cause a pause-dependent VT. So we just be careful and uh, be sure when you're given uh, atropine in these kind of patients. And uh, it is always not simple that there can be uh, just at the nodal level block or infranodal level block. It can be a multiple level blocks also which can be present. So uh, this is the example which we'll recap whatever we have learned, okay. So uh, this is the first ECG, okay, which shows there's a pass, okay. There is definitely a pass here, okay no electrical activity here. So there is no P wave here. So it says that there is a sinus nodal disease. And what is the PP interval? Okay, so sinus nodal disease, it can be sinus exit block or sinus arrest. So what is the PP interval? You look at the PP interval before. Okay, it's around five large squares. If it's around five large squares, and this pause, okay, is around 17 large squares, which means it's not a multiple of PP interval. If it's not a multiple of PP interval, it's going to be a sinus arrest or sinus pause. So since it is 17 large squares, okay, so it is more than three seconds. So it is it could be called a sinus arrest. Look at this example. Okay, what is happening here? Okay, look at this the rhythm strip here. Okay, there is definitely definitely some grouping of beats here. If there is a grouping of beats. Okay, what comes to your mind is some kind of Mobitz type 1 block. If it's Mobitz type 1 block, just see what, what is happening to the pause. If it is ending with the P wave or if it's not ending with the P wave. So if it is ending with the P wave, okay, it means that it is AV nodal disease. So there's, this is definitely a Mobitz type 1 AV nodal block. Okay, that is second degree Mobitz type 1 block. And along with it, what is again, what is present here, apart from that, there is also a inferior wall infarction, okay, there is inferior and also posterior wall infarction with almost reciprocal changes in the one and AVL, okay, so this puts it as inferior posterior wall MI with 3 is to 1 Mobitz type, Mobitz type 1 block. So here it is like the third beat is getting dropped and two beats are conducted, so it is 3 is to 1 Mobitz type 1 block. So this is another example, okay, uh, sorry if the clarity in this ECG is slightly poor. It's not a difficult ECG, okay, but still, what is happening to this ECG? You see every P wave is getting followed by a QRS, every P wave is getting followed by a QRS. There's not really a pause anywhere, okay, the rate is seeming to be good. But if you closely look, okay, the P waves here, 
or peaked. The T waves here are peaked. Whenever you get a T waves which are being peaked, always tease out and find out whether there is a P wave there or not. Okay. So you can either do a carotid sinus massage or adenosine to bring out the P wave, but there was definitely a P wave here. So it is almost 2 is to 1 AV block. So when it's 2 is to 1 AV block, you need to find out whether it's a Mobitz type 1 or Mobitz type 2. Okay. So whether it's Mobitz type 1 or type 2. Why do you say it's type 2? Yeah, the PR interval is almost normal. Whatever is being conducted in the conducted bead, the PR interval is normal. Even though the escape is narrow, okay, this is definitely an infranodal block. That is Movitz type 2 block. Do you want to give atropin in this patient? No. Okay, that's what. You're going to worsen the block. This 2 is to 1 block is going to become 3 is to 1 or 4 is to 1. So, you avoid giving atropine, even if this patient presents with a baradic area, okay, you're going to not give an atropine in this patient. This is the last one. What is this CC? Just any, any time when you see uh, this kind of ECG, just look at what are the PR interval. Is it 2 is to 1? No, just go by that flow chart. PR interval is constant. Okay, PR interval is not constant. Okay, is there a, a QRS associated every time with a P wave? No. no. So then it is a third degree AV block. Okay, fine. Thank you.